episode number five of The Scout Scientist. This week I'm going to be talking all about a genetic condition called cystic fibrosis. Now this condition is caused by changes in the CFTR gene. Now this stands for the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene. Now that's a bit of a mouthful. So what does the gene actually do? Because every gene in the body has got its own function. So this gene provides instructions for making a protein channel that transports chloride ions across the membranes of epithelial cells. So these are cells that produce mucus, sweat, saliva, tears and digestive enzymes. Now, the mucus that is produced is thin and free-flowing and this protects the lining of the airways, the digestive system and the reproductive system as well as other organs. Now, we can get small changes or mutations in this gene and when we get changes in the gene, this means that the channel can't function properly. So the chloride ion, ions aren't transported properly into cells and the mucus that is produced that is lining things like the lungs and the pancreas, instead of being thin and free flowing, it becomes thick and sticky and it ultimately clogs the airways and leads to all the symptoms of cystic fibrosis that I'll be talking about later on. But that's basically how the condition comes about. Now, there are lots and lots of different ways in which the gene can change in order to stop working properly. But the most common mutation, we call it phi 508 del Now, all that means is phi, which is phenylalanine, the amino acid, at position number 508 in, is deleted. Now, if you think back to my first video when I was talking about the DNA code and how it's written in just four letters, A, T, G and C. Well, the most common change, this V508 del, is caused by just the deletion of three single um, nucleotides or three letters of the DNA code. But there are over 2,000 different types of mutations that have been identified in the CFTR gene. So how is it inherited? Well, cystic fibrosis is what we call an autosomal recessive condition. So autosomal because it lies on one of the numbered chromosomes. So the gene is actually on chromosome number seven. And recessive because you need two copies of the gene to be faulty in order to get the condition. So if you think back to one of my earlier videos, I told you that we have two copies of every single gene one from our mum and one from our dad. Now in recessive conditions like this, both copies of the gene need to be faulty in order to get the condition. So if you think back to my video on Huntington disease, that was the opposite. So that was a dominant condition. So in Huntington disease, if you've got one faulty copy of the gene, it doesn't matter if the other one's working, you'll be affected with the disorder. However, for cystic fibrosis and other autosomal recessive conditions, both copies need to be faulty to get the condition. If you've just got one faulty copy and one working copy, then you are completely fine, but you are what we call a carrier. So let me introduce you to my fiancé, Christian. Um, now, he's managed to get out of all the videos so far, but I've somehow roped him into this one because I think it'll be a really good way to explain the inheritance. So, neither me or Christian has got a family history of CF. So, no one in my family's got cystic fibrosis or Christian's family. But in the UK population, the chance that either of us are a carrier of CF without even knowing it is roughly 1 in 25. So, let's just say, for instance, both me and Christian are carriers. If in the future we have a child, what would be the chance that that child will be affected with CF? So let's say we're both carriers. So we've both got one working copy of the gene and one faulty copy of the gene. So when we have a child, 
they get one copy from me and one copy from Christian. So option number one, I pass on my working copy of the gene and Christian also passes on his working copy of the gene. So our child has got two working copies of the gene, so they're not affected with cystic fibrosis and they're not a carrier. Option number two, I pass on my working copy of the gene, but Christian passes on his faulty copy of the gene. In this instance, the child would have one faulty copy and one working copy, so they would be a carrier of cystic fibrosis. Option number three, I pass on my faulty copy of the gene and Christian passes on his working copy. So again, in this instance, the child will be a carrier of CF. And option number four, I pass on my faulty copy of the gene and Christian also passes on his faulty copy of the gene. Now in this instance, the child would have two faulty copies of the gene and would therefore be affected with cystic fibrosis. So if we were both carriers of CF, the chance that we'd have a child affected would be one in four. Now, as it stands, neither, neither of us know if we're carriers or not, and we've got no family history of the disorder. So the chance that we would have a child affected with CF in the future is the chance that I'm a carrier, one in 25, multiplied by the chance that Christian's a carrier, also one in 25, multiplied by the likelihood that we both pass on our faulty copies, one in four. And that works out as one in 2,500. So that's the chance that we could have a child affected with CF. And that's the number of children in the UK today that are born with cystic fibrosis. So this week I've been over to Alderhey Children's Hospital here in Liverpool to interview Professor Kevin Southern who is a consultant paediatrician with a real interest in cystic fibrosis. So he really is the expert on CF and he knows a lot more about it than I do. So I went over there to interview him this week and here's a little snippet of um, what he was able to tell us. Thank you for um, letting me interview you. Yeah. And um, if we could just start off, if you could just tell us a little bit about the symptoms of CF and what you see the children presenting with here at the hospital. Mm. Well, I'm a paediatrician, so I look yeah. after children, and the outlook for children with cystic fibrosis has changed enormously over the past. Well, I, I've been looking after children with CF for, for over 30 years now, and, and over those 30 years, uh, their situation has improved enormously, partly because we now screen babies. So babies that are born yeah. are screened for a number of conditions, and one of those conditions is cystic fibrosis. So that has enabled us to identify babies at a much earlier age. So that was just a little snippet of the interview with Professor Southern, and if you want to see the full interview, then keep an eye out for um, the next episode, which is going to be part two of cystic fibrosis. During my time on the scientist training programme, I became friends with a girl called Jacqueline. She was also training to become a clinical scientist in genetics. I later learned that she was actually affected with cystic fibrosis. Now she's actually written something for me to share with you for this video about her life and her diagnosis um, and living with CF. So this is what she's put. I was diagnosed with CF at birth because I had a blocked bowel, which needed immediate surgery to fix. I was officially diagnosed by the sweat test, which was the standard test at the time in 1991. The paediatricians knew to look for CF in me because of my family history. At the time I was born, I had two older first cousins with CF as well. Despite my family history, because I had a healthy older brother, my parents were told that there was minimal risk of them having any children with CF. As the family history of CF was on my dad's side and my mum had no family history, she wasn't offered any sort of carrier testing. So when I was born and they were told I had CF, naturally they were in shock as they were advised that there was virtually no risk, which we now know is wrong. I lived a relatively normal life, 
except that I had to take pills with every meal because my pancreas doesn't produce the enzymes necessary to digest food, so I need synthetic enzymes to help me eat. My parents also had to give me physiotherapy twice a day, which was on a giant foam wedge that we kept in the living room. This is used to help clear my airways of mucus. I also had to take additional supplements such as vitamin A, D, E and K because those are the fat soluble vitamins and my body didn't absorb these like everyone else. In terms of chest infections, the most common symptom of CF, I was actually pretty lucky and don't really remember having chest infections when I was younger. My first experience of having an infection that I can remember was when I was 11 and I had to go into hospital to have intravenous antibiotics to clear it after the oral tablets didn't work. A few years after that I was put on prophylactic antibiotics which I had to take through a nebulizer and regularly take tablet antibiotics to try and keep infections at bay. I've had a few more intravenous antibiotics since my first spell when I was 11, 11 and I prefer to do these at home rather than in hospital. I had to be trained on how to flush out the lime with saline and heparin to stop it blocking and keep it clean and prepare the medicines using an aseptic technique. My parents were a massive help when I needed extra treatments and did everything for me when I was younger but now I've moved away from the family home I try to keep on top of everything myself. The most recent treatment I've started is the Simkevi tablets which are the drugs designed to treat the underlying cause of CF rather than just the symptoms. Due to a cost war between the drug company and the NHS, it's taken years for these to be approved in the UK, but I finally started these in the new year and I hope that I will start to notice an increase in my lung function in the next few months. We are also hoping to get access to Tricapta, the third generation of the new drugs which has shown to dramatically increase the lung function of those with CF. So there's been lots going on in this video, um, but hopefully you've learned something new about cystic fibrosis. So thank you to everyone who's been involved in the video, to Professor Southern, to Jacqueline and to Christian. Um, and if you want to see more of the interview with Professor Southern, then please look out for my next video. Um, most importantly, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. See you next time.